I am Ryan McKnight, and this is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason, so if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Hey, everybody. What you're about to listen to is a breaking news, I guess, uh, Mormon Leaks Minute. Uh, the reason why we're releasing this on a, an irregular day from our regular Thursday release is because there's a lot going on right now in the news with uh, Hurricane Harvey and uh, the people who are suffering through that in Texas. Of course, our, our thoughts and best wishes go out to them and everything that they're struggling through right now as this missionary was cut off from speaking with his parents, even though he was... Um, in an area that was possibly in danger. So this episode is just a quick, brief rundown of Ryan and I talking about this leak as it came out, this email exchange, and we hope that you uh, you enjoy in spite of the kind of somber nature of everything that's going on and the uh, massive destruction that is being wreaked upon Texas right now due to this hurricane as it is currently going on. And while the situation is definitely... Um, not pleasant. We really hope that the best will come of this, whatever that might be. So without further ado, this is a brief Mormon Leaks Minute, a uh, breaking news release on it. I'm Ryan McKnight, and welcome to the Mormon Leaks Minute. So many answers and assurances can come through daily searching and studying the scriptures and with sincere and pleading prayer. But there are no such promises on the internet. All right, everybody, we are doing an emergency recording Mormon Leaks Minute today. Ryan, welcome to the show, man. Hey, what's up? Not much, man. I've been, I don't know about you, but I've been glued to my uh, TV today just watching the coverage of Hurricane Harvey. Have you been kind of in a similar boat? Well, I, w I don't have TV, so, <laughs> <laughs> but I have been reading the updates online and looking at everybody's pictures online and everything like that, so. Yeah, this is definitely going to, I think, go down in the history books as something of a, of a monumental natural disaster. And I think I'm uh, fairly pessimistic about the current uh, ability of this country to handle such a disaster right now. And I'm even uh, more disparaged by the fact that this is going to dominate news coverage for so long and so many things are going to go unchecked during that time. So I think this is going to spell a lot of bad news, not just for Texas, but for uh, for the country as a whole. But we have something to talk about today. Um, you recently posted a leak uh, that is related to Hurricane Harvey. Do uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this? Um, yeah, it's, it's an email exchange um, between the father of a... Um, a missionary that's serving in Houston, Texas, in the Houston, Texas mission, and the mission president there. Um, the the father was trying to uh, get a hold of his son and, and make contact with his son to make sure he was okay. My understanding, well, maybe I should probably start with how I got the got the email, maybe. Um, the the father posted in a couple of different forums about this. He posted in, um, I believe, I, I know I saw it in the Mormon Stories Facebook group, and I saw it in um, uh, Reddit. Um, he posted. He didn't post the email, but he told the story of what happened. You know, he said, "Hey, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I can't believe this mission president. I tried to email him and ask him for my son's phone number, and you know, he said he's not going to give it to me." So I reached out to the guy and I said, hey, look, I don't know if we can help you or not, but we might be able to bring some attention to the situation, help you get in touch with your son. 
Um, and uh, he actually, we actually spoke on the phone. Um, okay. And my, you know, the, the guy was 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 genuinely shaken up. What was my take by it? Uh, um, well, that's understandable, um, given the fact that, you know, given what we're seeing on the news, you know, we're recording this on Sunday as Harvey has passed and is about to, you know, come back down through Houston. Uh, it's on August 27th we're recording this. So I can understand why this father would be a little concerned about his kid, you know, being stranded or flooded out or, you know, um, harmed by this storm. It's, um, I think any parent would be insane to not be worried right now. Yeah. And there's a couple of key points that, you know, are not evident in the letter. And a lot of people have been saying, well, you know, I mean, you know, oh, I would always have my, my kid's phone number or call the local bishop or, you know, things like this. And one of the, one of the things that people don't, you know, my, my understanding from talking to the father is that, is that this, this kid just got to the mission field. Um, and the parents were not even aware yet of where he had been sent. He's in his very, oh. he's been his very first area. Like he just got there. I'm not sure if it was this week or last week. Um, but he just got there and, uh, and they don't, they didn't even know what ward he was in or any, what area he was in or anything. Oh, wow. That, yeah, that makes it even more, uh, terrifying. I think that he only adds to the confusion more. Um, <laughs> Wow. Uh, I want to read this email because it's not very long. What do you think about doing that, Ryan? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So it's actually an email exchange that happened over a uh, a day and a half period. And the first email was obviously just a mass email that the mission president sent out or the, the church sent out to everybody with missionaries. And they said, hey, we're you know taking care of your kids. Uh, um, they're going to provide uh, updates on prepare preparations for the missionaries and ensure you that we are taking all precautions to keep them safe. And then it you know lists out a bunch of bullet points. But that's when um, I, I guess we can say John, uh, John sent an email. And do we want to read this first email that he sent in reply to this mass email? Yeah, sure. I can read that if you want. Yeah, sure. So he says, hi, Mr. Peterson. He's referring to um, the mission president, Jordan Peterson. Hi, Mr. Peterson. Although I appreciate your efforts to inform me of my son's safety, uh, mo modern technologies also allow me to directly check as well. It is preposterous that you would assert that there is no need for me to contact him. Is this, is this the right one? Am I reading this yeah, in this order? Is, okay, that's was... the next one, right? Okay, I want to make sure I'm reading it in order. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, it is uh, preposterous that you would assert that no one that there is no need for me to contact him. You aren't aware of all needs, and certainly not my needs. Again, I appreciate that you're taking care of things, but you really shouldn't act like people have no reason to contact their sons or daughters. You have no way of knowing everyone's reason for wanting to do that. I'd personally like to know how to directly contact my son, uh, Blank O'Connor. And please let me know how I can do that and f now and for the future. Thanks, John O'Connor. Okay, so that was a reply that was sent um, just 12 hours after the initial email that was sent out. Yeah. And then the next one after this is the reply that the mission president sent back to Brother O'Connor. He said, I appreciate your concern for your son. I wanted to let you know that Elder O'Connor uh, – let me – I'm not going to say that again <laughs> – no, that's fine. You can say Elder O'Connor. Oh, okay. I wanted to let you know that Elder O'Connor is located in a county that is not on the flood watch list, nor is it in the designated with a tropical storm warning. It is located to the north of Houston and is not expected to get the kind of rain we will get in Houston. If needed, we would evacuate others to his area because it is higher ground, so he's in a good place. I hope that gives you some comfort, as I know you love your son very much. Warmest regards, signed Jordan Peterson. And, yeah, and, and I don't know. I mean, like, it's in interesting because I don't know if the mission president realizes that the parents don't know where their son is located yet or not. You know, I yeah. don't know. It's weird because the way he, he wrote that in there, maybe he's assuming they've gotten word of that or, you know, he may not even realize who the parents are. He's, he's probably managing a ton of missionaries. Uh, and, and obviously the situation's high stress. It's possible that the mission president, you know, is just responding to an email generically here. Um, yeah, that's fair. But it's interesting that he doesn't say specifically where his son is located. 
Yeah, and it also took him a day to, or you know, more almost twelve hours to send this reply too. So I wonder what was going through uh, the uh, John's head at this time. You know, this mission president isn't replying, isn't saying anything, no contact whatsoever, and it's not like he can just call his son to see what's going on with him. So, so I can and those aren't that twelve was, overnight hours. That's like twelve hours during the day if you look at the timestamps. Yeah. Yeah, so John's email was sent at 10 in the morning. The reply from the mission president, Jordan, was at 9.30 at night. So, uh, yeah. Um, Do you want to read his reply to that that email? It's just saying, hey, you know, don't worry about it. Your son is fine. And then he just – a real quick short response. He said, could you please provide contact information as requested? Also, his name is O'Connor with an E-R, not – O'Connor O-R. He's correcting a spelling error. I think Mm -hmm. you can kind of tell – that, and that was the end of that email. I think you can kind of tell he's getting a little bit – frustrated at that point yeah absolutely um and then this is an absolutely astonishing email that was sent and uh this was let's see okay uh so john sent that email at about midnight on saturday morning and then the email at 10 in the morning after that so you know quite some time afterwards uh, 10 hours afterwards, it said, I have no information to provide you. Missionaries use email to contact their families on P-Day per mission policy uh, that Elder O'Connor agreed to. I assume that means signing his missionary contract or something to that effect. If you have specific concerns, I should know about Elder O'Connor that could help him. You can let me know directly. He is happy and enjoying his mission very much. <laughs> Uh, this is just uh, this is so condescending and frustrating he is becoming a very fine representative of jesus christ giving service and kindness to others he loves his family dearly you should be proud of him and i hope you'll understand this and support him in this decision to serve with all his heart might mind and strength to keep mission rules and policies signed jordan peterson president of the houston texas mission (laughs) (laughs) it's crazy (laughs) <laughs> that is just insane to see the verbiage of that, the actual exchange. And this was Saturday, you know, as the the hurricane was barreling in. I mean, I don't, I don't know. What do you make of this, Ryan? I'm sh- I'm I'm shocked. I really am. I mean, mission president. I I'm really just shocked that this mission president didn't have the common sense to say. Yeah, here's the phone number. Call your son. Just make it quick. I mean, he could have even just said, "Hey, you know, make it quick. We don't want this to become a big distraction, you know." But go ahead here, you know, call him and, and you know, and tell him that he can call you back if there's any emergency or whatever. I mean, right. how, how? Man, it's just. I, I maybe I've been out. I mean, I haven't been out of the church that long, but maybe it's been too long because I, I, I really, if somebody would have said this happened without me seeing proof of it. I would have been suspect of it being a true story. No kidding. And I think like one of the main takeaways of that, that exchange is that this uh, mission president is championing policy over a parent's concern for their own kid. Right. It it makes me think that he's more scared of the brethren than he is scared of uh, what an angry parent that is worried about their child being in danger from a massive natural disaster. I mean, that, that is just such a crazy disparity in my mind. But the thing is, is he's just upholding the church's policy in this, right? He didn't, this specific president, uh, Jordan Peterson didn't make these rules. He's just doing what they tell them to do. This just happens to be an extenuating circumstance that's kind of bending these rules and making them seem really clandestine and uh, just wrong. I'm not so sure that I even want to give him that much benefit, though, because while while I while I obviously would agree with you that there's a rule that they can't call their parents outside of those two times a year, um, I think it's. Pr- I think it's pretty clear, and I, I I wouldn't even be surprised if there was actually something in writing that said that a mission president can use their discretion to allow missionaries to call home. Okay, uh, the the idea that the the idea that there is like a a hard and fast rule that a mission president cannot make an exception for something like that, I I, I don't really think exists to me. To, to, I've never seen anything like that. And, and and we know, I mean, I've seen missionaries been given permission to call home for this reason or that reason. Um, but, of course, another thing that we've seen out of this leak um, is multiple stories in the comment threads and the various different social media platforms of people 
sharing similar stories that happened to them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was one I just read t- before you called me. Um, somebody said their brother got s- severely s- ill and was in the hospital for three days in another country. It was in, I think he was serving in Russia or it was somewhere over in that part of the world. And the, and the parents were never even contacted to be told that their son was in the hospital. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, wow. and, and then other, other examples of people. And I mean, I could tell you my own story with my, you know, with, of something that happened with my wife when her mother was sick and dying while my wife was on her mission. I mean, this, it's, it definitely happens. And, and I, I, I think, um, I mean, I guess, I mean, look, the mission presidents are people too, I suppose. And, you know, just like missionaries feel the pressure to follow rules, I guess they do too. And they, that may cloud their common sense. Um, so maybe I could, I could just a little, give him a little bit of slack in that. But, but I mean, you know, this is a 40 plus year old man, uh, and he should have the common sense to say, yeah, this is not only is this unreasonable, but we should probably have all the missionaries call their parents and tell them they're okay. I think, yeah, I think that this, the, the point that we're, I think both kind of driving at is that judgment should have been made differently. And, you know, this mission president should have had the mental faculties to be able to come to that judgment. But I think the point is the psychological control that the church has with their rule book, yeah. whether or not this is an actual rule, it does show that people are willing to go to, you know, they're willing to, uh, have a situation like this come up and still conform to the rule book at some extent and, you know, put off their better judgment in just yeah. <laughs> completely in spite of human decency in this case. Yeah, and I'll go with that. I think I think the next two – the la- I, there's only two more email uh, emails to read out of this exchange. I think this really kind of um, – Sums everything up really well. Do you want to read? Yeah, the well, I'll one? read. I'll read both of them. They're both from the father. Um, yeah. the, the the mission president had no more responses after the last one we just read. Um, but uh, at ten forty, which was four minutes after that email that he just received that you just read, he he wrote back and said, "You're telling me that you have no phone number that I can use to call blank O'Connor, or that or that you and then question mark or that you won't tell me question mark." You're t- uh, I'm not asking about his rules or yours. I'm telling you that I want to contact him and have a personal need to do so. That need is not only not any of your concern or business. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> was his parting line, which I'm sure the you know discredits this guy with every Mormon out there. But people need to realize that his dad is no longer a member of the church. Uh, the the mother is apparently, and the dad isn't. Okay. So, and then the the final email that he wrote about another hour later, he follows the, that up with, "I wonder how others will perceive you in your church from withholding contact information of young people during a Category Four hurricane. Regardless of your particular rules, you are being immoral. I am asking you for Bingo. information that will allow me to contact my son, and you do have that. Be be human for a moment instead of a mission president." And I'm guessing that it was shortly after that that he decided to post his story online. Yeah. Recounting this. Like I said, he didn't post the emails. I think he had quoted one of the emails. Uh, he quoted that last email from the mission president. Um, and was just kind of, and, and, and like I said, um, before people jump to a conclusion that this is an angry ex-Mormon, uh, out to get the church, I just want to uh. say that I, I've spoken to this man on the phone and, I mean, I'm sure he's doing a lot better today, but he was genuinely distressed yesterday. Uh, yeah, understandably so. His kid might be in danger of this this thing that we're we're just is just starting to happen as you and I are recording this. I mean, uh, he even told me he said, "If I'm sending you this email, he said it's because I want it to I want it to lead me to being able to talk to my son." Um, and good. You know, I, I, I was contacted by somebody that I know in the area after we published the email. And they said, hey, look, I know a lot of the missionaries here. You know, let me see if I can find this kid. And uh, she was able to find him. And in fact, it turned out that he was having dinner with a member that she actually knew personally. Oh, wow. 
No kidding. And um, I mean, I don't want to give too much of the details of this away because I don't know that I have permission to. But I'll say this. Uh, she spoke to the the missionary, confirmed that he was okay, and there was some hesitation on the part of the missionary to contact his father because... He wanted to follow the rules. Because of the rule situation. Yep. I don't know as of right now if the father has ultimately spoken to his son, but I I was able to put him into contact with my friend in Houston, and they've spoken on the phone, and I know that my friend is keeping tabs and, and, and told him that he would get an update anytime there was one needed. So, I mean, wow. we've gotten yeah. somewhat of a, you know, a half of a solution here. Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, I, I haven't spoken to the father since this morning, so it's possible that, you know, something has happened since then, uh, as far as him getting in touch with his son. I'm not, I'm not sure. But, um, I, I, I look, I, I hope, and I wouldn't be shocked if this leads to a, a memo going out to the mission president saying, hey, you know, let's, let's use your judgment. You know, when, when we had, I was on my mission during 9-11, and, uh, I was in Barcelona, and, even though the internet existed at the time, we didn't. We were not allowed to access the internet at all. We didn't even. We weren't even allowed to use emails wow. uh, in, in my mission, and I believe that was fairly common for most missions at that time. Um, so all we had was, you know, the handwritten letter every week, and I remember specifically being told, uh, you know, we were instructed not to call home. And that if our parents had any concerns that they can contact the mission, the mission home and, um, and, uh, get, you know, get information through the mission home. And I mean, look, that sounds like, well, 9-11, I wasn't in New York City. I wasn't in an, an Arab country. You know, what's the big deal? But one thing that we cannot forget in, in that situation was that, you know, when 9-11 happened, think about how we were not connected to internet or anything. What if, yeah, what if you had a family member in New York or something at the time, Well, right? that, and, and it's not just that. We we were hearing all kinds of crazy stories from people on the street <laughs> and members. We, oh, we yeah. little, I remember that we all were convinced that World War III was about to start. And we were even, we even um, had many conversations among us missionaries about what would happen if we were stranded in Spain during the war. Jeez, dude. So we just we did not have the proper perspective on what was going on. Uh, as bad as nine eleven was, um, I, I think for for several weeks, if not longer, we as missionaries thought it was even worse than it was ac- actually was. And and there were certain little things in Spain that didn't help that. For example, in Spain there are a lot of Muslims, um, and there's a lot of mosques, and and there's a huge Muslim presence in Spain. And because of the uncertainty of what had happened and everything going on, we were instructed for the time being not to speak to any Muslims, you know, in our tracking efforts, and to just sort of avoid mosques. And we had an earlier curfew, and it, and and that lasted for probably you know five or six months after nine eleven. And again, so you know, when when we get rules like that coming down from us, and um. And, you know, there were some other little incidences that caused some paranoia. That, but again, just it was paranoia out of the fact that we just didn't know what was going on. So I think a lot of people would have been would have benefited from a call home. Um, and uh, and, you know, I don't know that there was any complaints. I mean, I was an obedient missionary. I, I never thought two, more than two, two seconds about I mean, I, it never crossed my mind that I should be able to call home personally. But um but I'm sure that's probably not the case for everybody now that I look back on that. You know, I, I think this is – what we're doing right now is we are – right now, both of us are viewing this through our like ex-Mormon lens, right? Yeah. And through a, a way of trying to – or you know, in, in other cases, secular Mormon lens, right? Um, and – Oh, it's kind of hard to see this from a disconnected perspective, right? Because you and I, I, I didn't go on a mission. You did. You had, you were like a member of this incredibly like insular group of like Mormon brainwashing that is a mission. Yeah. I didn't ever go through that. So, you know, we're, but we're both still looking at this through like reverence for the church and obedience lens. You know, we're not terribly surprised that this happened. I, you know, I have a number of, uh, uh well, okay. So, I'll share my story of this. I had a, a very dear friend in high school whose brother went on uh, his mission and he actually died out on his mission and the parents weren't able to get to him fast 
um, during his his death because it happened very suddenly, and it just you know they basically only said we're very sorry and you have to come pick up the body now or we'll send it to you. Like it was a very hard time for their family. But the whole thing is is like these the the take people who are eighteen or nineteen years old, pluck them out of their world, and put them into an entirely echo chambered uh, insular world where they can't access the outside, they can't access any even family members through anything more than email. They can't talk to him. But you and I are like, yeah, that's just every day in the church. That's just the lifestyle that missionaries live. I'm trying to like disconnect as much as I possibly can to look at this because this is a baffling concept. Okay. If you are a member of some sort of group, if it, okay, any person looking at this from a non Mormon lens is going to say, why, why is this even a thing? If you are an 18 year old person, and you are, you know, parents of an 18 year old person, you should be able to freely talk whenever you want. There shouldn't be the, any existence of a middleman in between there that cuts you off from each other. That doesn't allow you to talk to each other. This is just an absolutely abhorrent and antiquated idea of what this, the world is. We are more connected than we ever have been. And the church is stifling that between missions, missionaries and their parents. And not only missionaries and their parents, but missionaries and everybody that they could possibly talk to. And it's done at the very smallest level of you can only email on your P day. And that's only usually to family members. And it goes all the way up to you can't watch the news. You can't listen to any outside music. You can't see anything except for church approved materials. I just find this a very hard concept to grapple with. And I don't know how I can try and view this for, through a non Mormon lens and see it as uh, people who are not a member of this, who have never been exposed to this would see it because it's just something so abhorrent and cult like that. It's, it, it's, I, I don't know. I, I don't have any way to like sum it up. If you really want me to um, set you and your listeners off, I'll tell you what happened to my wife on her mission. She, my uh, my wife and I served in the same mission, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, we both served in the Barcelona mission. She's from Spain. Um, she's from another part of Spain. And um, we didn't actually know each other very well on our mission. We served in the same district for six weeks, but that was pretty much the only time we'd ever known each other. The rest of our mission, we were nowhere near each other. But... Um, this happened before I actually met her. Um, her mother, wa who was living in Madrid, who, which is a, was about four hours on a train away from where she was at, you know, from Barcelona. Um, her mother was diagnosed with advanced cancer um, and was was basically, I mean, they did try some treatment, I believe, but was basically given a death sentence immediately. Um my wife was allowed to to call her mother on a daily basis, and she did do that. And when the doctors, when she was finally in the hospital for the last time, and the doctor said, basically, you're going to die any day now, she met with our mission president, and he said to her, now this is what she tells me. Um, this is the story she tells. Uh the mission president told her that she could go visit her mom in the hospital if she wanted to. The mission would pay for her to go visit her, but that it, she should pray about it because it may be better for her to remember her mother in her healthier days. Uh, yeah. So my wife and you know anybody that knows my wife knows that when she was in the church, she was 110% in. Um, and, you know, she went home and prayed. And of course, the answer came that, you know, she should put her mission first. So she didn't go, and uh, her mother died, of course, within a few days, and she took a few days uh, in her mission apartment to grieve that. Um, one of the ways she got over her mother's death so quickly or was able to cope with it so well was because of the comfort of, you know, knowing that she would see her mother again one day and, you know, in the celestial kingdom or what have you. And when you fast forward, uh, you know, 15, 16 years, when my wife is starting to have her own doubts and, and to slowly leave the church, one of the things that was hardest for her to overcome was the fact that she had to, you know, well, initially she thought that if she didn't believe in the church, you know, that she would have to also abandon belief of seeing her mother again. And I tried to encourage her to believe, you know, I told her, you know, you, you don't have to be a Mormon to believe in an afterlife. You can still believe in an afterlife and not be Mormon. 
But when, and once she got over that, then she had to deal with the fact that she didn't go see her mother. And, um, you know, I can't probably do it justice to explain, um, how that has affected her, but I can just tell you that even to this day, uh, some, you know, three and a half, four years after she's left the church and, you know, uh, almost 20 years since her mom has died, it's still the guilt and the regret are, are extreme. And what I've always said when talking to people about this story is the mission president should have, should not have said, Hey, you know, if you want to go see your mom, you can. No, he should have had a plane or a train ticket waiting for her. And he should have said, here's your train ticket. I want you to go and you come back whenever you're ready. Um, that there shouldn't even be a question on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, if she would have, if she would have come out on her own after that, after them providing her with a train ticket and for some reason, which I doubt would have ever happened, if some reason said, you know, I feel like I need to stay. I'd rather remember my mother in, you know, in her better times. Then I, I guess then that would be, you know, something that she would have to decide. But when they make that suggestion, and when think about people who are listening to this, think about the position the mission president is over these young people, which my wife was one of them at the time. They are in a position of complete authority. And so this, when they make suggestions like this, it is often not just taken as a suggestion. Some people might like say, oh, well, she was given the choice. No, she was not. Because it was it was symbolic of what yeah. she was really choosing, right? She it was a matter of are you going to choose your mission and your eternal glory, or are you going to choose your family who you're going to see again, right? Right. And I can only imagine that she essentially had to mourn her mother a second time when she realized that that was not going to be the case anymore. Well, and the proof is the, the proof is is that she knows if you ask her now. She's and not in a million years would she have made the same decision. She didn't want to remember. Yeah, of course, she didn't want to remember her mother in her healthier days. She wanted to go say goodbye to her mother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine that because that's humanity. You want to you want to remember the people the best way that you can. But if you're just and it, okay. It's baffling to me that was a just a train ride away. And <laughs> yeah. like you said, that's what the mission president should have done. He should have been human, just like it says in this this uh, email exchange that we read between uh, John and uh, Jordan here. You should be human. And uh, at that point, they were being immoral in trying to set up a false dichotomy that way or like in, in uh, Jordan's case, putting himself in between a man and his son who may be in danger. I, the the thing is, like, I guess the overall point, we need to understand that this is not okay. This is not moral. This is not something that we should champion. The complete and utter disconnection of missionaries from the entire outside world is a very damaging concept in the long run. And you talk to a lot of Mormons and ex-Mormons, and they're going to have similar tales of what, you know, something happened during their or a loved one's mission. That they should have been there for, that the mission president said something like what he did to uh, Ryan's wife. You know, you have to choose your mission essentially at this time. That's – this is an utterly horrific concept to have and it just points to how how much this brainwashing, how deeply ingrained this brainwashing really is into a missionary's lifestyle. Um, and unfortunately, there's no easy way to look at this that the church or that this mission president specifically doesn't look bad in when we look at this this email in proper context and when we see just how prevalent these problems really are with missions. So I I guess that's kind of the the point of it all. And I'm going to put up this episode tonight. Uh, you and I are recording this Sunday night. It's going to go up tonight because I think that this is a prescient topic. It's, yeah. uh, it's breaking right now. And if this goes up on Thursday, many more things can happen in the, you know, the four and a half days until then. And we really like, we need to raise awareness about this right now. So yeah, we just talked and we had no idea anything like this was going to happen. So yeah, I pr listen and, and I want to say to you, Bryce, and, I'll, and, and to your listeners who, who uh, give you positive feedback about these segments. I, I really appreciate you helping bring awareness to our leaks. Um, you know, no matter how big or small they are, um, the information, information is power. And uh, I, I love talking about them. And I really appreciate you reaching out to me whenever we have something to talk about. 
Absolutely. And uh, I thank you as well, Ryan, for being a, a recurring correspondent. I've been enjoying these quite a lot, and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive about these. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. It's just going to go up warts, and also we can get up, up as, fast, as fast as we possibly can. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today, man. It's been a pleasure. Sounds good. All right, and that's going to do it. Thanks for listening in, and we'll be back this upcoming Thursday with a regular scheduled episode, and maybe we'll give an update on how things have developed with uh, uh, Mr. O'Connor and his son from then. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk to you later this week. Thanks for listening in. Seating Podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.